a pleasure to be here again. Um, it's been a little bit of time. Last time I was talking about climate change. And just uh, for those of you who are really interested in climate change, which I hope is everyone, I will put a little bit of climate change in at the end. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to talk about the greatest birth cohort in Canadian history, the Canadian <clears throat> Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development uh, Birth Cohort. And uh, this is led by uh, Malcolm Sears, and this is a picture of, no, that, actually that's not Malcolm. Um, this is a picture of Malcolm, <coughs> um, who is uh, at the um, <coughs> McMaster University in Hamilton. Excuse me, uh, for those online, I'm sorry, I'm going to be clearing my throat. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, that is a real photo uh, outside of Sitka. I didn't take it, though. So I want to um, introduce the birth cohort. Um, the reason being it's uh, really a fantastic resource that um, you could access. Um, <clears throat> I'll outline mainly the exposure assessment component, because that's what um, I've been most involved in. And I know um, you all love exposure assessment. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to describe this uh, formulation of one of the analytic uh, tools we're trying to develop. As you can imagine, with highly dimensional data, like uh, we have uh, thousands of variables that um, predict exposure. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to address uh, highly dimensional data um, and the uh, challenges of that. And then I do have some early results uh, that uh, hopefully will wet your whistle. Um, for further interest in child. Please, um, you know, I've been in enough uh, boring uh, lectures to know that they are uh, much more interesting. If you stop me, interrupt, stand up and do a little dance, do something uh, engaged, then that would, that would be great and I would appreciate it. Um, I'm going to just do a brief outline of some of the birth cohorts that led up to child. Uh, so, um, Dr. Sears was uh, deeply involved in the Dunedin uh, Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study. <clears throat> so these uh, twins, actually most of them, uh, were born in 1972-73. Uh, um, they were, um, there are a thousand of them, um, and uh, they are, as you can see, not identical. <laughs> One of, the, um, w one of the interesting aspects of the study uh, was the respiratory part, and that's how Malcolm uh, was um, um, so uh, involved, because he's a, a pediatric respirologist. And they got lung function. This is um, uh, FEV1 um, over FBC, um, <clears throat> that being the forced expiratory volume in the first second. It's a measure of airways, disease a marker of, uh, for um, uh, restricted, uh, for obstructed airways, I should say, and, uh, and asthma. <clears throat> anyway, what you see here uh, is age, FEV1, and the point that where somebody starts, at least at this measurement, which is nine years of age, is where they end up, uh, 26 years of age. Actually, this still holds true. These um, these kids are now um, in their 40s. And that's a really important point because uh, what it means is that everything is already cooked by this age. Your respiratory trajectory is decided actually well before age 9. We think it's uh, decided um, before age 3. And we're trying to show that in child. Um, <clears throat> But that, um, that has implications for um, exposure and uh, public health, and that's where we wanted to, uh, to <clears throat> uh, examine. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Paul Byrne, O'Byrne, who is now uh, the president of McMaster, uh, remembered that uh, one of his bright uh, medical residents had been uh, working on pulmonary function in infants and was able to measure pulmonary function in very young ages, like after birth. And uh, so 
so why don't we do another cohort study in Canada? This is um, around uh, 2001. And that's uh, PJ um, Padmaja Sabaro, who uh, is at the University of Toronto and um, is one of the co-PIs of uh, CHILD. So um, <clears throat> at that time, uh, the Allergen National Center for Excellence was uh, developing, and um, one of the visionaries of Allergen um, is uh, Dr. Judah Denberg, um, immunologist um, uh, and uh, clinician. And <clears throat> he, um, seeing this uh, really quite dramatic rise over the previous decades uh, in asthma, and particularly asthma in childhood, uh, thought, well, what are the underlying causes of this major increase in allergic diseases and asthma? You know, it, overall, air pollution in North America was going down, so um, air pollution might not be the whole part of it, and, but it, it, you know, that's, air pollution is still in the mix, as we'll discuss. Uh, what, was there some change in infectious disease patterns? Um, kids being in daycare, yes or no? All of, all of these kinds of uh, things were, were shifting, and, and the arrow was not pointing to any particular exposure or experience um, that uh, caused allergy and asthma um, beyond uh, genetic component, which is about 30%. So what if you designed this network that could integrate multiple um, mechanistic and clinical studies to look at, uh, at allergy, and um, what better way to do that than in a, in a birth cohort? So um, a large uh, RFA was announced by CAHR um, 2004, um, and uh, it was designed for examining indoor exposures, genes, and gene environment interactions in the etiology of asthma and allergy in early childhood. Now, this was um, just when I came to Canada. Um, with, this was rolling out in 2005, and uh, it was perfect for me. I had been very interested in um, gene environment interaction. I had focused mostly on occupational um, and uh, uh, kind of obscure lung disease called beryllium disease, but it was one of the best models at the time for the interaction between a genotype that makes you more susceptible to an exposure, that being beryllium, causing lung disease. And so this was really uh, serendipitous for me in my career, <clears throat> and I uh, quickly became um, very engaged in child. So between 2008 um, and 2012, we recruited uh, 3,624 3, babies um, and mothers and a smaller number of fathers at these four sites across Canada. <clears throat> so a good-sized birth cohort. And we integrated um, in many, many disciplines. Uh, <clears throat> this is a... I would say partial list of all the disciplines of investigators and child. So we're we're looking at um, exposure in the broadest sense, psychosocial exposures, um, the classic exposures. Um, I'll I'll get into more details. And we have five year period in which to do this. We have a bunch of different visits. I'm happy to answer um, questions about any of these, but um, these are. Uh, critical time points, uh, particularly in the first two years. Uh, as, as mentioned, we're, our belief is that the action is in utero and in those first few years. So we have some um, um, hypotheses going in related to inflammation, um, and uh, this view that there's a lot of airways disease, most of it in childhood is asthma, and asthma is uh, certainly one of the uh, largest. But it, by the time you're in adulthood, um, COPD is also a major uh, airways disease that probably has some origins in childhood. And some estimate that over half of asthma 
in adults is actually um, not IgE mediated or allergic asthma, but uh, a Th1 dominated immune response, a different kind of inflammation. So we're interested in inflammation. We are particularly interested in oxidant exposures that contribute to inflammation, and this is a really exciting epithelial um, cellular biology uh, that we can go into in discussion maybe. Um, and I think this group has heard from Chris Carlston, um, who's doing um, excellent work down at BGH uh, in this area. So we're interested in any exposures that cause oxidizing effects at the um, mucous membrane or systemically. Um, and and that's, that whole systemic thing is, is a kind of a new area. Uh, but the, the action, um, at least when we were designing the study, we thought was at the epithelium of the lung and uh, the two different pathways, a Th1 driven um, immunity and a Th2 driven immunity, uh, which results in persistent asthma or airways disease, uh, some of which, as I mentioned, is COPD. So our question from exposure standpoint was, is it these oxidative uh, exposures or oxidative stress, as the case may be, as I'll get into in a minute, um, do they contribute to an innate immune response uh, or do they in some way boost uh, adaptive immunity? Is there a synergy perhaps between diesel exhaust smoke and dust mite allergen? We have um, a lot of different exposures. Uh, of course, you, you um, have been familiar with many of them. Um, a lot of uh, talk in this uh, school about particulate air pollution. <clears throat> Tobac tobacco smoke, of course, uh, is a major ex exposure. Uh, and other environmental factors, such as temperature. Um, and it, exposure through the lungs affecting um, the epigenome, perhaps, um, and thereby uh, changing phenotype and uh, resulting in asthma. And all of these uh, areas um, can, of course, be measured from the exposure side to the physiology uh, to the epigenome. We're measuring epigenome in child, the genome, of course, um, inhibitory RNAs. Uh, this is about <clears throat> where we've uh, stopped for now. Uh, the proteome and the metabolome are of high interest, and um, Kelly McNagney uh, here at UBC is helping us with the metabolome. Um, and, and that's hopefully uh, a part of a uh, child that will come in the future. But the point here is the multiple pollutants um, interact to modify the inflammatory effect. And how do they do it together? So in our exposure assessment, we have over 1,500 um, um, items uh, from questionnaires. We have a single home. Um, visit at age three months, where you have a trained uh, technician, um, uh, a barefoot industrial hygienist, I think would be an apt description of um, these RAs. And um, we include uh, measures of um, in dust, in urine. Uh, we have uh, air pollution through land use regression. We have uh, time location information. We're interested in, in activity. Um, diet, medications, we measure stress through um, a variety of instruments in the mum. Uh, the microbiome, uh, we measure in stool, and I'll tell you a very exciting uh, result that just came out on the microbiome. Um, we have seasonal and climatic information, uh, and we are looking at greenness. Um, greenness has been um, linked to many health outcomes, including birth weight, um, in recent uh, years, and uh, that's another opportunity for child. So we're trying to put all of this together in an individual expo exposure profile from period of time in utero to uh, first five years of life. And um, I'll refer back often to this um, longitudinal 
component of child because it's a it's another dimension. Of course, it's very important. So um, this is uh, sort of where we are. Uh, we finished recruitment in July of 2012, um, and uh, 2013 we have all the home visits. We have the first year uh, clinical visits um, last year, um, and this is the date when the cohort finishes uh, because they're stretched out over two and a half years, so they're kind of rolling through. Um, and by uh, July of this year, we'll be um, um, complete on our four-year uh, visits, and uh, by 2018, we'll have all the five years. Uh, we do have already about 800 five-year exams, so that's our clinical endpoint where asthma is either diagnosed or not, and um, our final um, measure of uh, ATP or, or, or allergy. So any questions about the timeline, the kind of building blocks of um, this cohort? Yes? Yeah, it's a really good question. We also wanted um, them not to be uh, biased towards a population that had a lot of asthma. So asthma has a hereditary component. And um, so, I mean, I don't really know the answer to your question because we're not um, we're, we're not collecting that information but the scuttlebutt is that um, parents are very interested in environmental um, exposures of their children and they recognize that we don't know them very much and they are altruistically contributing to knowledge there's a little bit of incentive. We sort of bumped it up as we were having problems with recruiting, but it's really monetarily um, very small um, amounts of money, and uh, mostly it was uh, due to this um, need need to contribute. And um, unfortunately, it the, the, the recruitment didn't go like completely. We were able to recruit um, for as a, we would have liked to as a, a generalizable um, sample. We have a lot of white people, we have a lot of educated people, we have more than we should uh, people with asthma and allergy. Um, so there are issues with the, uh, with the recruitment, but, but it's, um, it's quite remarkable and it does include all ethnicities uh, or major ethnicities in Canada. Um, and uh, it does have a rural component, a very small one, albeit uh, 200 um, subjects that are from rural uh, Manitoba. But um, it's, it's a, a really great resource, and it has uh, a lot of these exposure variables. So we have home environment variables, uh, we have smoking, we have air pollution, we have uh, information on the um, work and school environment, we have diet, we have uh, pets, we have socioeconomic information, it's pretty detailed. We have viral swabs from the first few years of life. We have psychosocial measurements of stress. So all of these um, linked to our immune phenotypes, our genetics, uh, and clinical phenotypes, including some uh, early pulmonary function in the Toronto cohort and uh, a limited number of microbiome samples, are. Um, the exposure assessment for child. And we have a nice paper now, uh, came out last year in uh, Jesse. This is a little detail on uh, how uh, we collect the information. So uh, this is the exposure on um, uh, the left hand side, and then uh, we get questionnaire information in all these areas. But uh, for some of them, we're also able to measure, do measurements in dust. And we have a large uh, uh, number of dust samples, uh, two rooms in, in each home. Uh, we have the home assessment at three months, where we measure dampness, uh, mold, and uh, semi-volatiles. Uh, we have biomarkers. We have uh, cotinine and uh, phthalates uh, from urine at three months of age. Uh, again, uh, for the phthalates, we have uh, um, uh, at three years of age, 
um, and we'll have another uh, opportunity at four years of age, I mean at five years of age. Not all of these samples are um, out of the freezer. A child is a wonderful resource, but it is a very poor resource in the sense of we have no more money. <laughs> you know, we can't uh, analyze 5% uh, of the samples that we have. We're, uh, we're about, we're, we're mostly financed now for the whole genome, so we will have all the genomic information. We have very limited um, epigenomic information, only, um, uh, well, we'll hear later this next week if we have funding for 500 uh, epigenomes. We have done about 144 so far. So there's lots of information, but much of it is uh, sitting in the freezer. And uh, we also have uh, ge uh, ge geographic models that we use. Uh, I'll, the land use regression is familiar to you. Um, and um, some remote sensing data we're beginning to use as well, including the greenness that I'll talk about. So um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. These are the entry criteria. I'm not going to um, really get into this. this. This little photograph here, this is somebody's room, actually. Um, from a previous study I did in Seattle. I don't know if you can appreciate that, but there's like 50 little stuffed animals hanging in a room of an asthmatic child. Okay, there, there you go. Um, <clears throat> so for our child, our, um, uh, these are our, our demographics um, and, um, and health status um, for the mom and the dad. And uh, you can see there's uh, uh, quite a number uh, uh, reported any allergy, a number, 20%, uh, uh, this is over the national average for asthma, um, and 57% um, uh, atopic by skin testing. So these are, these are um, more allergic parents than um, uh, the, the general population, as I mentioned. Uh, it's a highly educated group. Um, it's largely white, 72%, but we do have a mix of other ethnicities. And the parents are, uh, as you can see, 32 and 33. So um, those are these are the uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, <laughs> choose your parents wisely. Um, it uh, there is a large component in this uh, that, that is related to genetics, but the epigenetic part is probably bigger. In other words, the influence of exposure on the epigenome has probably a greater impact in these chronic diseases than the, the actual genetic code. Um, so when you're choosing your parents, uh, you also need to uh, think about the home environment, uh, what it will be like uh, growing up. Will you be stressed out um, or will you be calm, getting a good education, uh, good nutrition, um, and living in a relatively low air pollution environment, or will you have the opposite of all those things? Uh, some of that we'll be able to dissect in child. So this is some uh, information about the uh, the extent of our data. We have uh, cord blood, uh, and and we have of course birth weight. Uh, we have information on um, uh, hospital stays and 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 the uh, anthropomorphic uh, measurements. This was a surprising finding to me. I am I am not uh, in obstetrics, and so I just really didn't understand that antibiotics is this common um, at birth. Uh, so that's going to be interesting in our microbiome. Uh, I uh, wanted to show you today how this breaks out by center because it does, it does differ by center, but I couldn't get that information. Um, our mean gestational age is 26.7. Uh, is We're going to be using that in some of our environmental exposure endpoints. Uh, gestational age is a really good indicator of uh, issues later in life, and uh, half of our um, babies had uh, siblings. Uh, this is some information about uh, wheeze, um, colds, uh, a lot of, um, of this going on in early life, as you might imagine. Uh, not every wheeze is the same, and um, there is a whole trajectory that has been described in these early years, as well as the one I showed you for later years, uh, 
of different patterns of weeds. And um, so these inf this infection information may help us understand that better. We had um, a lot of breastfeeding. Uh, in fact, 60% uh, of the cohort uh, was exclusively breastfed um, from zero to three months. Um, we have a wide variation in the introduction of foods, which is really a hot area in um, allergy and immunology right now, uh, sort of the age of food uh, introduction. We have a lot of interesting peanut information, and um, the story is definitely still out on peanuts. Um, lots of, um, for this age, at one year we have 15% with um, positive skin prick tests. But this is pretty, uh, pretty amazing, um, partly reflective, of course, of the parents. But um, we're going to have something to see because uh, it's clear that we're getting uh, interesting exposures. As I mentioned peanuts. There's 5% at one year are already allergic to peanuts. Um, and this is a, an interesting little um, analysis we're doing right now with our dust. We're finding, uh, not surprisingly, I guess, a lot of peanuts in the dust. This is house dust. Um, and there's a lot more in uh, Alberta, just saying, in the house dust, more peanuts. And particularly the other, other rooms, and like the TV room, you know, people in... So it may be that the kids at one, at under one are not eating peanuts, but they're crawling around in the peanuts in the floor and getting sensitized. Um, here's some uh, household characteristics. I'm not, not going to dwell on this too much, but uh, just so uh, you uh, can get a feel for the kind of um, uh, opportunities a uh, child represents, we have a pretty good variation in... Um, um, pets in the home. Um, we have uh, uh, varying levels of, um, of uh, pests um, and uh, the different uh, mite species varies across um, the different cities. And so we have, um, we have um, some a nice variation to deal with. Uh, this is uh, not terribly surprising. I guess, you know, Toronto has a lot more co cockroaches than any uh, other place um, that I'll say something about the politics there, but I probably shouldn't uh, do that. Um, <clears throat> then uh, this is familiar to everyone, land use regression. The Mike's talked here. And so this we have uh, for two places, um, the home as well as uh, the second most common place the child goes um, at um, various time points. Um, uh, but focusing on um, that, that first year. And um, uh, Hin Chibibhi, who you all probably know, um, has a really nice paper that came out in Environmental Health Perspectives this year, or 2015, using this data and the skin prick test data, so with ATP and air pollution relationship um, nicely shown there. Uh, and here's the difference in um, uh, nitrogen dioxide as a surrogate for uh, air pollution, traffic-related air pollution in the different cities um, with uh, Winnipeg really, really um, much cleaner. Um, this I'm going to flash through because uh, I want to have some time for, uh, for discussion. But um, uh, these are, um, this is the peanut an allergen. Um, and uh, yeah, I was. I think I said Alberta, but I meant Winnipeg when I said that the uh, peanut allergen in the TV room. Uh, this is not an artifact, I'm, and uh, and yeah, it's just su sort of surprising. This is the other room, not the bedroom that we measure dust in, and um, uh, this is peanut allergen. It's kind of interesting. Uh, this is mouse, and uh, the the two rooms. Are, are represented by the two dots, right, in uh, different cities. And uh, that, that varies nicely, too. I'm, uh, yeah, Vancouver has a lot of mouse antigen. Who'd have thought? Um, and this is uh, dust mite, two uh, different species, uh, DER-P and DER-F. Um, uh, dust mite antigen, 
and nice variation there. And uh, interesting, a lot of variation across the two rooms, um, more so than some of the other antigens. I'm not, I'm not sure what to make with that. And this is uh, uh, dog and cat antigen again. Um, good variation, and hopefully we'll be able to make something of that. There's uh, new information, well, not that new maybe, uh, that at a certain age, the dog is protective for asthma. Um, that the endotoxin um, uh, tunes the immune system more towards the Th1 um, non-allergic asthma response. And then um, the problem is that later endotoxin definitely exacerbates asthma. So um, the dog is good, but not for long, <laughs> I think is the message there. And there is a really nice gene-environment interaction um, uh, with, with the dog antigen. So greenness, um, I don't know if Perry or anybody's talked about uh, green, greenness and NVDI. Oh. Um, so this is a, a measure I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is collected remotely um, through uh, satellites. And um, the idea is that um, greenness around a residence is good. And uh, in fact, there were many, have been many studies to show the, yes, that you get higher, higher birth weight babies um, and all of that. But the, the actual mechanism is very poorly understood. Um, why this measurement of greenness corresponds to higher birth weight babies. It, there have been con, uh, conflicting studies now. There's a negative study coming out of Texas. Um, and we're not sure about exactly what this measurement means. The um, hypothesis is that um, things are healthier in green spaces. <laughs> sort of, in a nutshell. Um, and it holds up sometimes, but not not always. We're measuring it in child. It's uh, it's um, uh, you know uh, the story is uh, still out there on that. There is a very nice study of Vancouver that um, Perry Heistad did. It was published in 2014 in EHP, showing um, a, a tight relationship with um, with birth weight and uh, small for gestational age for a combination for for the greenness index by itself but also for a combination of these other spatially related exposures. Um, so Hugh Davies um, and, and colleagues provided a noise um, exposure, land use regression. There's um, Larry Frank's walkability index, and then the um, air pollution land use regression data. So they did a really nice job combining these, and uh, we're doing the same um, without noise, unfortunately, but, but uh, we're doing the same uh, analysis for all of the child cities. So um, I'm thinking I'm dating myself here with the talking heads. Um, but um, so this is my beautiful data, but how can I use it? Um, as you can see, it's a pretty complex mix and you know we have some ideas about um, biological pathways uh, that uh, these exposures might operate under. Um, we consider um, stress in early life as an exposure. Uh, we consider um, uh, as, of, uh, as of an early analysis that there probably are risky microbiomes and not so risky microbiomes when it comes to developing asthma and allergy. Uh, we know that um, food introduction and the timing has something to do with the development of um, asthma and allergy. So trying to put all this together is, is quite, um, quite a, a problem. And um, you know, the standard uh, multiple logistic regressions just don't run after a while when you, you start adding in variables. And some of you, I'm sure, have had this experience. It, um, 
um, the nature of um, of the uh, software and anal analytic tool is uh, not adequate for this kind of highly dimensional data. So we try um, things like penalized logistic regression, um, which uh, attempts to constrain um, the variables. Uh, we try um, principal component analysis uh, or the kinds of factor analysis where um, the correlation between variables is used uh, to cluster them. Uh, we use Bayesian hierarchical models, um, machine learning models. All these uh, uh, statistical techniques uh, that are trying to uh, distill data from an enormous number of things that don't really make sense altogether to a more manageable number of things that hopefully make sense in some way. <laughs> and um, it's a you know, data distillation or clustering or um, a priori uh, ways of restricting data um, also are used. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, a little bit next. And, and I would really appreciate um, feedback from uh, you and the problems that you've faced in um, higher dimensional data analyses and how you've um, how you've solved them. So um, the a priori classification scheme or is also known as a de decision tree approach uses uh, information. Uh, like odds ratios or relative risks uh, from the published literature for every individual exposure. So nitrogen dioxide or traffic related air pollution or PM 2.5 or um, phthalates or um, any of these exposures that have published literature about their risk in a population. Now this is al almost always um, not perfect for child because the ages studied are different. The locations are different. The time, the contexts are different. Um, but uh, the a priori classification scheme uh, tries to uh, synthesize the literature into a meaningful number uh, for the, any given exposure. And by meaningful, in this case, uh, most of that is yes or no. Is there an exposure or is there not an exposure? We're, very rarely are we able to um, incorporate in the approach we're taking right now anyway, um, more complex uh, uh, weighted measures. So for smoking we do because we have a lot of information about smoking and dose response curve is very clear. For air pollution we can do it. Um, but for some of these exposures like dog um, antigen or, or cat antigen, yeah, there is a clinical threshold, but that clinical threshold is really related to children that already have asthma, and it's for exacerbations of their disease. So, you know, exactly what the right number is is um, often not clear in these exposures, and so we have taken the approach of using a yes or no, exposed or not. And that's very imperfect because most of these exposures have some kind of linear um, aspect to them, and it's not on or off. Um, so that that is another um, uh, dimension of the problem in the a priori classification approach. Now, all of these models um, um, can be uh, tested against each other, and uh, one way of doing that is structural equation modeling. Um, this allows comparisons of um, validity of competing models, and so you're basically testing how well does this model predict versus um, this other one, and, and so you can use a, a different approaches from that long list that I just mentioned. And look at um, you can look at uh, relations between latent constructs, um, and these these uh, constructs are are error free indices that reflect the variance that is shared by multiple indicators. And this, this is helpful when you have all the, the collinearity issues that we have. 
The power of these um, structural equation models um, depends upon the complexity of the pathway and the, the quality of the models in the comparison. So that, that's not surprising. So this is a, this is a way we might uh, um, navigate our way through um, some of the complexities in child. This is the a priori index that I'm working on, uh, where I mentioned just now the point system. Um, so we're using different domains of exposure and grouping uh, all our variables on the questionnaires. So if you are exposed to laminate flooring or have vinyl, you get a point for um, uh, semi-volatile organics. And if you don't have that in your house, your questionnaires don't show that, you should get zero. So then we divide by the number in the domain, so we're not um, biasing our result by virtue of how many, um, how many variables there are. For example, household cleaning, we have um, dozens of household cleaning products named. Uh, and so with this, we come up with, um, and we're focusing really on the indoor exposures at this point, um, using that method of, well, the literature says that phthalates um, uh, cause asthma, and uh, the odds ratio for it uh, is 2.3. So we're going to give that a point of you know, you know, one point if you have phthalate exposure in the upper quartile. So there is a little bit of um, um, non-randomness to the yes, no. You have to be in the upper quartile of exposures. And then you get a point for that particular phthalate. So this, in this way, we combine um, all the oxidative exposures that we have in our, in, in our data set. And you can see a different measure for each of the domains, uh, and then actually come up with one number that is an estimate of the indoor oxidative exposures um, at uh, whatever age it is. We focused on three months, because that's where richest data is. Oops. Um, so this is held up, actually. I mean, it's kind of, it sounded, it sounds a little uh, crazy. I mean, even to, to me, I mean, I've been working on this for quite some time. And I'm, every time it does work, I'm kind of surprised that it, but it, it has worked for IL-6 uh, in cord blood. It has worked for um, methylation changes in um, uh, lymphocytic um, DNA. Um, it has worked for FEV1 uh, in infants. So it's, um, we have a lot of work to still to do on it. Um, and it's uh, going to be challenging to validate. But once we have our complete data set, we will be doing these structural equation modelings to test it against other more standard methods to test it against principal component analysis, to test it against um, uh, other things that people come up with. Uh, the machine learning is kind of an interesting concept um, where a computer um, does iterations of your data and, and um, improves models similar to, I think, the Bayesian approach. I frankly don't know a lot about machine learning yet. But um, we're trying to make sense of all this. Now, um, we have help uh, from, we have gotten some, some additional funding. Um, we have uh, microbiome funding. We have um, a food uh, grant through Sophia Anand at um, uh, McMaster. We have um, a uh, sleep, um, disorder in a small sub-cohort in Edmonton. We have the traffic-related air pollution um, work through Allergen. And we've gotten quite a bit of money, uh, 2.7 million, from uh, Health Canada to look at the uh, phthalates. 
so we've done okay in terms of uh, getting um, more money. We have some uh, pretty interesting findings. I mentioned the one uh, that Hind uh, Shibi was involved in, uh, Mike Brower. Um, we have um, found uh, through the Health Canada funding, also funded cotinine, that about 80% of Canadian three-month-olds have uh, signs of exposure to cigarette smoke. Now, we have very low smoking rates. Um, and even um, the rates of people who say, yes, my baby was exposed to secondhand smoke, that is only uh, about 15%. So there's this enormous number of um, kids exposed where we don't really know how they're exposed. And it's maybe the third hand smoke idea, you know, where uh, the nicotine is in your clothing um, that could be just from a second hand exposure. And then the baby snuggles up and gets uh, a dose that way. It's really not clear what the mechanism for these um, um, large number of babies at three months who have cotinine um, sign of cigarette expo exposure. But um, child hopefully will enable us to uh, understand that better. We found um, that uh, phthalate metabolites in, um, in urine are associated with early atopy. Um, we have um, shown the microbiome is uh, dramatically affected um, by C-section. This is not a new finding. Others have shown this. Um, but that uh, the antibiotic use, uh, household pet, and presence of siblings influences the microbiome of your dust, which is reflected in the microbiome of the stool. Um, I've mentioned this about the microbiome and associated with uh, food uh, sensitization, but the most exciting one is this one on the bottom um, it, that was published in um, Science and Translational Medicine uh, in September. Uh, some of you know, might know uh, some of these investigators, Stuart Turvey, Brett Finley. Um, they were able to show that um, this so-called, it's called flavor. I mean, I have to look it up because I can never remember the, the ones. Um, so these are families of bacteria in um, the gut that influence your risk of asthma. And... Uh, this is the um, the data here. So these, what um, we don't have asthma yet. So uh, the the cohort is too young. But what we do have is atopy and wheeze. And um, in other studies, this group that has both atopy and wheeze has about a 75 percent chance of developing asthma. So it's a high risk group. And there's also something called the asthma predictive index, which, which even increases it more. So they were able to use this endpoint, the A to P plus Wee's endpoint, as a surrogate for asthma, and uh, show that this particular combination of microbes in your stool at three months of age protects you from this phenotype. And that if you get that protective phenoty uh, the, that protective um, families of bacteria at one year, it's too late. That there is no benefit if the flora changes at one year. And then the reason it got into translational science, translational medicine, was because they did this in mice. They used the asthma mouse model. And they introduced these bugs and protected the mouse from developing asthma, real, real asthma, not, not this surrogate um, asthma predictive index. So that, that's pretty cool. And um, uh, it led me to uh, um, do a kind of a 
spoof that I, since I realized this was online, I didn't really want to put it up there, but it's, um, Malcolm Sears really did say, get down and get dirty, um, after the study came out, and I have a little um, dance, he's doing a little dance, get down and get dirty, um, but it's not appropriate for uh, online. Um, <clears throat> So um, I'm just going um, uh, to end on this uh, note about um, climate change. I mentioned I would say something about climate change. Um, so what you see here is a number of admissions, and this is from data from England, um, between 2002 and 2010. This is nothing new. Uh, everybody knows there is a, a seasonal um, effect on asthma. These are childhood admissions for asthma, so this is not incident asthma. This is... Um, admission uh, for asthma or asthma exacerbation. But it does make the point I'm trying to make, which is that there is a seasonal trend to asthma, and it's the same every year. In the fall, we get this big peak, and then it tapers off, um, and by you know January it's pretty low, and then it goes up again, and it does that every year. And it is probably related to microbial exposure, but there are many things that vary in this way. Um, and whenever I see a biological symbol like signal like this these days, I think, okay, well, what is this biological signal going to do with climate change? And child provides a great opportunity to study what is the effect of being born um, in one month versus another month. And uh, how does that interact with air pollution and indoor air pollution and dog antigen and um, rain and temperature and mold and moisture and all of that? So that's, stay tuned um, for that. Um, and I um, uh, just wanted to thank our, our different uh, partners and child that have helped us out and are still helping us out. And... Um, if we could um, use the last few minutes to talk about highly dimensional data analysis, that would be great. Thank you. I think there might be some questions before we get to the highly dimensional data analysis, but thank you very much, Tim. Hi, thank you. Um, you were talking about the population selection for this study. Do you think that there are some subpopulations, uh, you know, in Canada or the United States in general, that should be studied separately? Um, you, you mentioned, say, hereditary tendencies towards asthma uh, or, say, home conditions. Would you, would you say for, say, First Nations people, yeah. that that might be deserving of a separate study? Yeah, I, I thank you for the question. It's a really good one, um, and particularly for the example you give. Um, I think uh, the whole the, the study of um, First Nations and um, Aboriginal peoples is um, a very complicated one, and the reason why um, it's not being done a lot right now. Um, we would have liked to have had more. Um, Aboriginal um, participation in our study. The question I think you're asking is, would you, if you design a study that's only for recruiting those people um, or uh, some other specific, specific population, would you get a better study? It depends on what your question is, right? If it's about Aboriginal housing and impacts on asthma, then yes, that's the, that's the population. But if you're um, wanting to understand origins, you know, of asthma and allergy in all people, then that's a different different question, right? And it's a different study design. I th it's, um, it's helpful at times to have your restricted population, but the genetic studies in particular were, have, have really gotten into big trouble when you do a genetic study in one population, and then you say, oh, yeah, this, this gene and this um, uh, exposure causes X. It, it might, in that special context, 
But to try to generalize them is often fraught with error um, because the context makes so much difference. And that's the reason I shy away from uh, the specific studies, except if your question can only be answered by a special study. How do these triggers um, work in development? Is it through the transformation of the genome and the phenotype? And will it always uh, show up again in, adult in adulthood? Or So you mean like an asthma trigger that yes. uh, res um, triggers an airway responsiveness? Um, so that's, a, that's also a good question. Most of them. Uh, the same exposure that uh, is contributing to the development of asthma also is a trigger in the use of the word that you used um, for the exacerbation of existing asthma. And it's, it, that's based on the measurement of the FEV1, this forced expiratory volume in one second. That's the measure of um, obstructed airway. And so, and you can do these in chambers too. So you um, take a, an asthmatic and expose them, and they get the 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 drop in airway um, uh, uh, openness. Uh, they they have airway restriction, and that's the same exposure that we think is causing uh, the development of asthma in, in a young child. But it's at when it is. Causing the development, of course, it's not triggering uh, hyperactive airways. It's doing something else biologically. And that um, is part of what we're trying to understand. Uh, the, the, the example of the, the chamber exposure, that's, the mechanism is really nicely worked out. The mechanism of the development of asthma, not so much. Does that answer the question? Sometimes you have it as a, uh, as a child. Then uh, in adolescence, it goes away. Yeah. But then at old age, it would come back. Yes. Is, is that? Uh, That's a very common um, pattern. And uh, that, that fits our, um, our ideas about the uh, relationship between adult and asthma and childhood asthma. Um, and uh, in occupational medicine, of course, we see this very often, right? Where um, the worker as an adolescent is fine, um, even doing isocyanates, but then at some age, and it's usually pretty early, um, in the late 20s, uh, early 30s, that same isocyanate exposure gives them debilitating asthma, and they can't get near a paint booth. One more question from Berlin. Thank you, Tim. Um, so these days, a lot of pediatricians are recommending to introduce common allergens really early on, yep. like peanut butter and fish, et cetera. Yep. So I, I know you mentioned a little bit, but can you comment? Like, should, is that true, or do we know if there's enough scientific evidence that that would help? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a uh, practicing um, pediatric as, asthma specialist. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, like, demur on actually recommending this. I think um, there is a lot of information about the beneficial effects of early introduction of food that runs counter to... Um, previous recommendations of the Canadian Pediatric Society. Um, but the, the, their pediatric um, uh, society has issued new guidelines with regards to early introduction to food, um, moving the dates earlier. So I think that is that is the way the data is going. Um, the, um, the caveat, the reason I'm not just like saying, oh, well, yeah, everybody should introduce early is because I'm not sure that's correct. That um, some of some of the genotypes are probably not the ones you want to do it. And 
then do you, the, the the place we are, I think, in this is okay. So if you have a population-based benefit, but it's at the expense of um, a few anaphylactic reactions, is that still something you should do? Um, and probably that makes sense from a population st uh, public health standpoint that you would get a broad benefit for a small small risk. I mean, that's sort of the approach we take to vaccinations, right? There is a small risk, but the population benefit is enormous and much outweighs that small risk. Okay, folks, we are at time, so thank you very much, Tim. And if there's further questions, I'm sure you can ask them after we wrap up here. Thank you.